had uh, Shabir Chima, who was the, the program director for the Department of Economic and Social Affairs in the United Nations, uh, to present a seminar uh, for the series. Tonight, Dr. Mead Leakey, uh, the matriarch and standard bearer of the anthropology Leakey family, who are among the most important scientists of the last century, will present a seminar entitled My Life in Science, An Evening with Mead Leakey. Over the past four decades, Dr. Leakey has co-directed the Kubi Fora Research Project with her eldest daughter, Louise, unearthing much of our current understanding of the past. Uh, in recognition of the 50-year relationship between Dr. Leakey and the National Geographic Society, she is a National Geographic Explorer in Residence, and she is also a research professor at Stony Brook University. Please join me in welcoming our very special guest, Dr. Mead Leakey. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm talking to you tonight about my work in Kenya. Um, for the last over 40 years now, I've been wandering around the deserts of northern Kenya, looking for evidence of our ancestry. Um, the things we have found have really changed the way we see our past. And I, have a, I think it's a great privilege to have done this myself. And I'd just like to share with you some of the excitement of doing this sort of work. Um, okay, so the way I got into this is, um, is quite fun, because I always wanted to be a marine um, zoologist. My dream in life was to do oceanography and marine zoology. And I never ever dreamed that I'd be doing anything close to what I'm doing today. Um, but what happened was, after I finished my first degree, at the University of North, North Wales in England, which specialised in marine sciences, I started applying for jobs and found a long succession of negative answers. And the reason was because I was the wrong gender. In those days, very few women were in science and um, they didn't like having women on boats unless absolutely necessary. So I got a little bit um, frustrated and decided I'd start looking for work elsewhere. And this is how I, I found one day an advert in, in one of the newspapers in England advertising a job in Kenya um, at a primate research centre. And before long I found myself on an airplane to Kenya. Um, I was met at the airport by Louis Leakey and the next thing I was in this primate research centre looking at monkeys. Nothing like um, looking at fish and things in the sea, but anyway, it was a lot of fun. So, um, this is how it all, my life took a completely a different course and not one that I'd imagined in, in any way would happen. Um, the the um, days that took up at, at, um, at this private research centre, I was able to, to collect data for my PhD and Lewis had um, asked me if I would do my thesis on um, monkey skeletons because he believed that he could get the taxonomy on skeletons and not just on teeth and skulls. And so um, he asked me if I could look at the, the collection of primates that they had there of skeletons and um, the boy said that he could put a monkey bone in his mouth and tell you what species it was. <laughs> I never tested him on that one, but I doubt he could really. Um, so uh, after I had done um, work there for a couple of years, I went back to England, took, um, wrote my thesis, um, my dissertation, and then um, came back to the, the primate centre for just for six months because the police asked me if I could um, look, if I could um, take care of the just for continuity reasons because the the lady who was running it was leaving and he wanted somebody to be there while we got somebody else in later. And um, so during that six months, I met Richard, um, my current husband, and Lewis's middle son. And um, he invited me to work at Tacana with him, and he's just started an expedition there then. So um, the, the reason that I had known about Lewis, of course, was because Lewis and um, Mary Leakey had made their name at Old Rye Gorge. They had looked for many, many years ago for evidence of human ancestry. In those days, it was thought that humans evolved in Asia. Nobody believed humans evolved in Africa, and it was an anathema to think that anyway. 
And so people told her she was wasting his time and being a bit foolish. And he was convinced that if he kept looking at that, he would find evidence of a early human ancestry at Old Park. And the reason he, he was so convinced was because there were stone tools all over the boards. So when we were to the boards, there were very ancient um, stone artifacts which convinced him that um, if he kept looking, he would find the maker of the stone tools. So from 1931 until 1959, um, he and Mary went back to Old Park every time they could. They spent several weeks there um, searching and searching and found many fossils, but not um, evidence of humanity until 1959. And then Mary found this amazing skull, which um, was named uh, C. Gentropus. And um, this was a, a, just a complete surprise to everybody, especially those who really didn't think that humans evolved in Africa. And the biggest surprise indeed was that they sent some um, rocks off the dating to find out how old it was. And the date that came back was um, one and three quarters of a million years. And people at that time thought that human ancestors certainly didn't go back any more than 400,000 years at the very most. So this um, ancient date for humans in, in um, Tanzania was um, a great interest. Uh, so that, that the, um, the, the discovery of this star led the National Geographic Society to fund their work. And so the work that they did um, in the next 10 years was so well funded that Mary was able to spend most of her time at Old Park. And during that the next 10 years, they found an enormous number of, um, of new specimens. And um, the, the initial one was the one on the left there, which was um, a nurse named Hermahabalis. And the one at the top is a, a later specimen that um, was clearly related to the specimens that had been fossils that were known from Asia, which were known as Homo erectus. So, um, in between 1960 and 1970, they unearthed a number of specimens of several fossils which um, showed human ancestry at Old Bay was quite complex. And, and not at all um, the simple picture that people had dreamt of. Nevertheless, compared to what we know today, um, the family tree that Lewis um, drew was, is really basically quite simple. It goes from an early Miocene form through Homo habilis to Homo sapiens. Lewis never believed that Homo erectus had anything to do with modern humans. He only thought that it was Homo habilis and then Homo sapiens. And so um, that was that was a very simple tree, and um, uh, this is how it was looking in 1970. Can't turn this thing on. So um, while I was when I went back to work at the Primary Research Centre, it was a year that um, Richard first worked in the Omo Valley in southern Ethiopia. Um, this is a site which is at the north end of Lake Turkana. Thank you. <laughs> 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 right. um, so Richard was leading an expedition, an international expedition, in the Oma Valley in southern Ethiopia. Um, um, he was uh, working there during that summer. And one day, while he was flying north um, to, to uh, the Oma Valley, he noticed sediments um, under the airplane on the east side of the lake. So first of all, I just want to put you on the map because I realise that um, many people's geography is not very good and I realise my geography of this area is very good so I suspect your geography of Africa might not be quite as um, well, I'm sure most of you, but some people maybe don't know where Kenya exactly is. So the green there is Kenya and Kenya is a country with a lot of um, arid desert land, which I think is not, not well understood even by the people living there. Because the, the part of Kenya that the tourists go to is the, the part of the Rift Valley, which is green and lush and has lots of wildlife and is very attractive. But 80% of the country is either desert or semi-arid. And Lake Turkana 
that you can see at the top there um, is in, as you see, in the middle of this um, hot, arid desert area. So I feel kind of over here and around in the sun. So as, as some Richard was flying up to the Oma Valley, he looked on the airplane and he saw these sediments everywhere. And got very excited because on the map it was marked as lava. And it was an area that had never been um, explored before for fossils. And so he thought, well, that, that certainly looks promising. And he's finding fossils in the Oma Valley, so the Russians may be on the east side of the bay. And so he borrowed the helicopter from the um, Oma expedition. And Flew down to the side of the lake, landed the helicopter, jumped out, and found fossils and stone tools all over the place. So he picked up one of each, get back in the helicopter, and to this day doesn't know where he landed. <laughs> However, because the inside of the lake is so rich, um, it, it's, um, there's so many fossil sites, I'm sure we've probably been back to the area where he anyway. Um, in 1968, Richard was making the Geographic, the National Geographic Society, to fund a preliminary expedition just to survey the east side of the lake to see if there actually were fossils in all those sediments. Because we never know you could have sedimentary deposits with no fossils. Um, and so you had to actually look on the ground to understand if they're there or not. Um, this is the uh, camp they had in 68, and you see they had this little, little red boat. I wasn't there at that time. And um, the little red boat served to take them up and down the shoreline of the lake, and then they would walk in from the lake shore um, at various different points. Um, and that way they'd be able to, when they were able to walk over a lot of the area, and probably some of the way. Um, occasionally they would drive, and then they would put up these little fly camps. And fly camps were always exciting, and especially in those days when there was a lot of wildlife around, and um, lions were um, something you heard every day and very frequently saw. And so we have many lion stories, and I'll just tell you two. Um, one, one of the things that Lewis always said to Richard and all his kids and all the people that work with him was, if you're camping, you need both ends of your tent open. Because if a lion walks through it and walks into it, if, he, if one end is shut, the lion can't get out. So he needs both ends open. And so this is what we always do. And one morning, um, a couple of our field workers woke up and saw these pug marks walking through the middle of the tent between their two beds. But they didn't know anything about it in the night and nothing happened. But um, curious lions did quite some happy Go um, on another occasion, the field crew decided they needed some meat. And so they decided that they would raid a lion's kill. And so they found some lions happily chewing on a, an antelope carp, as an example. And um, they drove their carp, chose right into the lion, stole the kill that the lion was really enjoying, put it in the back of the car. And they started to drive off thinking the lions had gone, but they hadn't at all. The lions were chasing the car. So the chase was coming, there's no road, so it was really rough bumpy the bump country. And this car was going as fast as it could with a lion galloping after them. That was the last time they ever stole a lion's meal. Um, so at the end of the 68 expedition, these are the fossils that they found. And this was enough for, um, to make to show them that it was definitely worth the time. And um, but as well as these, these um, fossil human ancestors, fragments that they found, they also found many, many other fossils. It is an incredibly rich area, um, an amazing area, actually. So in 1969, Richard um, asked, invited me to join the expedition because he said that my knowledge of modern monkeys would be great and I could come and study the fossil monkeys. He was amassing um, a group of young people to work up there on various aspects of um, geology, and paleontology, paleo environments, and all that sort of thing. Um, and so I arrived, and they were camped along the lake shore, like you see there, and um, very exciting um, time. But they camped, everyone was talking about the discovery that one of the, the, um, the scientists had made of some stone tools. Um, and these stone tools were 
be very, very early, and um, it's one of the main things that people are looking at. It's trying to find same tools that were earlier than the tools of, of uh, good, good. So um, there was a lot of excitement there, and um, Richard had decided that the best way to get around up there, because there were no roads, was to take some camels. And so he had organized to have a, um, a four riding camels and about 10 or 11 packed camels, and we could go off with these camels and do our exploration on, on camel rather than in a vehicle. So if you drive vehicles where you don't know where the sites are, then um, you're in danger of, of driving over the fossil. So, um, so he asked me if I'd like to join him and some of his crew on this camel. Um, he had found four um, retired police camels to, to ride, and the rest were pack animals. And these retired police camels were incredibly retired. <laughs> they had no intention of going anywhere except for the tunnel that Richard had got for himself, which was quite good. And so he was always out ahead while we were struggling to find people to spread our tunnel that we had better go forward. So we, um, we went we kind of went north for a couple of days and then stopped at a um, place near a town, a little town called Illarek. And um, we were finding fossils everywhere, it was amazing. And then Richard and I were walking towards a, a little dry sand river, and there sitting on the sand, in this little sand river, was um, this skull here. And it was a, one of those amazing moments in life. It was, it was just sitting looking at us. It was almost ten days to the day that Mary had found St. Jacques, and this was clearly the same sort of, of, um, of species. So that it had this big crest on its head and big teeth. And, um, and it, was, it was just sitting there. And never again have we ever found a skull in that situation. We're always they're broken in pieces or they have to be excavated or whatever. But this was my first.